Hey everyone, this is Amber Key, and you're listening to A Bright Idea Podcast, a show where I sit down with entrepreneurs to discuss the aha moments that launched their businesses. On today's episode, we're joined by the founder of Chosen Financial Group and Wealth Management Advisor, Bilal Afalabi. Bilal was born in Togo, Africa and moved to Hartford, Connecticut at eight years old. Bilal started his wealth management journey at 19 years old through a nationally ranked internship program at Northwestern Mutual. He was the number one intern in the Northeast, ranking top 10 nationally out of 2,500 interns in 2014 and 2015. Today, Bilal is a certified financial planner, a chartered financial consultant, and the founder and wealth management consultant at Chosen Financial Group, where he specializes in working with pre-retirees, retirees, and the emerging affluent. Bilal is a nationally ranked speaker on financial planning, speaker at the National Medical Conference, and has been in articles from the Certified Financial Planning Board. He currently serves on the Goodwin University School of Business Advisory Board to assist in shaping their curriculum and improving enrollment for new students. For his hard work, Forbes recognized him as Best in State Top Financial Security Professional in 2023, and he was awarded as the youngest ever four under 40 in the state of Connecticut in 2016. In this episode, Bilal and I discuss his upbringing, how he worked to achieve a healthy relationship with money, and how his clients make their money work for them. This is sort of a deep question to start off our conversation, but I just have one question is like, what do you think your eight-year-old self would think about all the success you've had thus far in your career and your life? Wow. Uh, Yeah, way to start deep. Uh, Eight-year-old me. I think my eight-year-old self would just be excited for the journey, ultimately, Mm -hmm. Um, looking back on it. And it was just a whole new world for us, moving from Togo, Africa to United States when I was eight and just thinking through what is going to happen. I mean, eight-year-old me had no idea, but looking back on it, I think proud uh, would be the response. I love that. And the reason that I asked that question is I was um, I was getting ready for this interview earlier today and I keep a small picture of myself like on my mirror in my bathroom. Um, it's like this picture that I like took when I was like six and I'm like in this like mermaid costume and it's like it's like the silliest picture but I do it on purpose because sometimes when you're like going through your day to day you're not thinking about like where like you came from and where you are now and so sometimes when I look at that picture it's like the reminder to stop and smell the roses a little bit but also I asked about eight-year-old taking you back to your eight-year-old self because you had mentioned that you are from Togo and that's where um, in eight, I think eight was like a pivotal time in your life, like when you moved here to the U.S. So can you take us through your background a little bit um, about being from there, where your parents are from and kind of how you ended up here in the United States? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, my last name is Afalabi. Uh, it's a Nigerian name, Yoruba. So my father's side is from Nigeria. Uh, my mother's side is actually from Ghana and they moved to Togo. And that's where me and my older sister was born. And when I was born, my father had actually left the country in pursuit of a better life for us. So for the first eight years of my life, I grew up in this patriarchal society with my mother and my sister. And Amber, quite frankly, I was happy. Um, I love Togo, and I think it's just more about thinking through what you're exposed to. So I was exposed to everyone coming together to have dinner every single night. Family was a key component for us. Uh, My mother used to walk me to school uh, all the time. And also being a young kid, I remember going to the market. And pretty much the market for, for us is a place where people come together as a community to sell their goods and products and services. And that's how people made a living. I remember being a little kid accompanying my mother uh, on those trips and just remembering that is just it just brings joy to me. Um, so that was the first eight years of my life. I was super happy. I was super excited. I had this big family around me. And then we had the phone call that we're moving to the U.S. So coming from Togo, when you hear of America, um, especially as a young kid, what you're thinking of is I'm going to see flying cars. I'm going <laughs> to see beautiful parks. I'm yeah. going to love the snow. And then we ended up in Hartford, Connecticut, which at the time was one of the top 10 poorest cities in the U.S. 
So needless to say, the cars are flying. Um, and re later realized I did not love the snow. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a good experience overall. And that was my journey in Togo to the U.S. And then when we came to the U.S., growing up in inner city for a couple of years, my father had started his own business. And I think at the time, that's when the seed was planted for me to aspire to have my own business one day. Mm -hmm. So he started his own trucking company, Mark Carrier LLC. And after a few years, he started hiring employees and business went well. So he moved us from Hartford to Windsor, Connecticut. It's a bit more the suburbs. And that's why I went to middle school and, and high school. So mm -hmm. as a young kid, I knew family uh, was key for me and also aspiring to have your own business one day. Not just for the financial resources, but the impact that he was having on other people by employing people that look like him. Right. So to me, those two powerful seeds were planted at a young age. When you were living in Togo, what jobs did your parents have? Uh, everyone's in sales. <laughs> uh, I come from a lineage of all business owners, uh, and that's what everyone did. My grandmother, my grandfather, everyone just sold some type of product. Mm -hmm. uh, what were they selling? anything. Uh, my mother would sell clothes, she would sell food, literally anything just to make it buy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really what we had to do every single day. And it worked for us. Um, later, we learned that uh, just great grandparents, they did really well too. Everyone just owned businesses. They owned real estate back home too. So they were renting out places for people to live. And either because they're doing that, they still went out to the market and still uh, sold some goods. Uh, I had uncles where they'll go to Togo, buy certain stuff, or go to Nigeria, buy some other stuff, or go to Ghana. So it was literally just selling products. Yeah. Uh, my grandfather, on my father's side, what he did was uh, money exchange. And it was real life money. He was really just counting money and just exchanging it. And that's how he made a living. So wow. everyone has some creative way of making money to afford their lifestyle. You talked about, about earlier how when you were living in Togo, you were happy. Like yeah. you were just, you were just a happy kid. How would your parents describe you growing up? I was a happy kid. I was a kid. I would talk to everybody. Um, and I, that was my personality. Mm -hmm. I, I'd say hello to everyone. I want to talk to everyone. And I was ultimately, I think I was, I was a good kid. I think my mom might have beat me once in my life right like but that was it like and constantly i'm just trying to do the right stuff i got good grades in school uh in togo we had a ranking system so mm -hmm. literally you take a test like your first of your class second of your class if i was in top three i was in trouble so constantly it was just high expectations uh for me mm -hmm. and they tell stories of just being a giver in school i used to get uh school allowance to go buy food and i'd go buy food and just give it to other people as a kid. Um, why? I just felt like the right thing to do because I had what I needed. Mm -hmm. So that's how they describe me as this, this always happy and always giving. Um, and I like to think I'm still the same person today. So talk to me a little bit about, okay, so you moved here in yep. when you were eight. Mm -hmm. And I read that you moved to Hartford, Connecticut, it was Hartford, right? Yeah. Connecticut. And you learned your third language. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, three languages. That's pretty cool. <laughs> what, when I think of Connecticut, I feel like, you know, on top of the U.S. already being a culture shock from mm -hmm. where you're from in Togo, um, what was like the, how did you... I hate to use the word like assimilate or like, how did you, first of all, let me not assume, was it a culture shock for you? Absolutely. Can you like take me through that yeah. and like school and high school and all the things? It was so different. Um, I think the, the first thing is when you move to a different place, you don't speak the language. Uh, and my native tongue is a way, which sounds like nothing mm -hmm. uh, compared to English and that we spoke French in school. So I moved to the U.S. and it's like learning hello, hi. So I started learning English, quite frankly, watching TV and putting the subtitles on. Um, I just got a CD player, right, dating myself. Uh, put the headphones on, listen to music, <laughs> play it, hit pause, and write the words out. Yeah. Excuse me. And constantly would just continue to practice that to learn English. I go to school. I was doing the best I can. I was in ESL, English second language, but I need an ETL, English third <laughs> language. Um, and I wanted to quickly learn the language. And one of the things that I started to learn quickly is that I learned the skill set to be able to connect with people quickly. 
hmm. and earn their trust. And I had no idea that my life experiences were leading me on this path, but I think that's one of my gifts today is to be able to meet a complete stranger and get them to trust me quickly. And I think part of the reason was just my life story. Moved here when I was eight, had to make friends quickly. I love people. So I was like, how could I do that quickly? And then two years later, middle school, we moved to Windsor, Connecticut, and I had to do it all over again. I was a new kid again. Mm. Years after that, we were in high school. I'm the new kid again. Four years after that, you're in college. I'm the new kid again. So constantly being the new kid and having to adapt and naturally being what I I thought I was an extrovert, but over time I realized I'm actually an introvert. Mm. (laughs) Um, But being extroverted, it's it made you constantly want to connect with people just so you can have your own sense of community. Um, So that's what I got out of it. And as far as the culture shock, I mean, we used to play soccer back home in Togo. You come to the U.S. and saw basketball and American football. Same thing in middle school and high school. Um, Kids were mean in inner city. Yeah. (laughs) Kids are always mean, but like, yes. Yeah. Inner, inner city kids are another level. <laughs> it's definitely another level. So that took some getting used to. Um, I had to overcome trying to fit in uh, mm-hmm. as well. I realized that, hey, you're your own person. And to me, that just took time and some experiences. But yeah. I learned that I quickly gravitate towards typically the type of whatever group I associate myself with. So I learned that, hey, I just have to associate myself with some really amazing people. Yeah. And you do that, the more you're going to elevate yourself and continue to just expand on, on your knowledge. All right? I think is the, the famous saying that, show me your five closest friends and I'll show you who you are. So for me, it's constantly, how could I just continue to enhance my circle, what that looks like? Yeah, that's so interesting. And I, I love that you're talking about how you enhanced your circle and and you talked about like how you had to assimilate and try to fit in to to these groups. But what I find too, that I find really interesting in your story, um, you know, we all somehow find a common ground between like, there's very few things. It's like music, there's food and there's sport. And so you talked about how you played soccer um, back in Togo. And then you also played soccer here. You ended up going to college for soccer, right? Mm-hmm. so were you in like leagues growing up what do you moved here and that's kind of how you made your friendships and and grew in that way absolutely I remember going to I think when we first moved to the U.S. in elementary school I think it was one day it was recess and it's like hey just go outside and play today we're gonna play soccer <laughs> and that was to me one of like my happiest moments in elementary school because I just took the ball and I just ran circles to everyone to score goals and it yeah. would just drop them off like he is so good uh, so at that point, that's when I realized, uh, huh, I can use soccer to, to my advantage. And same thing in middle school and high school, playing varsity as a freshman and yeah, getting a scholarship to go play in college. But soccer became one of those things for me. And mm. also for me, the other thing was math. I love math. The thing I love about math is it's, it's either yes or no. There's no in between. One plus one is equals two in every language. Yeah. So to me, math became my subject. And I think that made sense to major in finance and econ in college as well. So I just gravitated towards a couple of those things um, growing up. So yeah. Um, so, so you're getting ready to go to college. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, education was a big thing in your family, um, mm-hmm. as you had mentioned. Um you know, what was the, what did you want to be? Like, did, did you want to be a soccer player? Did you want to go into math? Like what was, and, and also what was the conversation with your family uh, when you were deciding on schools? Yeah. So Amber, I was supposed to go to, uh, move to London and play soccer for Chelsea. Uh, Wait, but, what? No, so no, many- that did not happen. That did not happen. That, that, that was my dream, but I was not good enough to do that. Don't do that because I'm super gullible. I like believe everything. So I was like, wow, that's awesome. Um, no, see, that was my dream. That did not come true. Uh, so unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to do that. But growing up, if you're all sports, you're going to go to college. And for us in our household, you only have four majors to choose from. I was either going to become a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer, or going to business. Like, that was it. Uh, and that's how strict my household was. I couldn't pick anything else. And I chose business mainly because numbers and it just made sense i didn't have to argue one point or another and i just want to say this is math Mm -hmm. um so i remember being in high school time to go to college start looking at all the choices i wanted to go to an accredited business school i wanted a school that afforded me the opportunity to play soccer as well um and when it came around i found my top choice i had my college visit i was super excited 
I ran through the door to my family, like, hey, this is where I'm going to go to school. And the first question out of their mouth was, how much is it? And I said, well, it's $30,000 a year. Uh, it's tuition, room and board, all is 30 grand a year. My father said, no, it's 120. Like, no, no, it's 30,000. He says, are you only going to go there for one year? I was like, no, at least four. So in his mind, it wasn't 30, it was 120. Yeah. He says, son, we can't afford $120,000 for you to go to school for four years. So then I was extremely disappointed and a couple of weeks goes by and the school calls me back. The coach that was recruiting me says, hey, Bilal, what's going on? You're a top recruit for the year. Um, are you coming? I said, hey, I really love to, but like, we really can't afford 120,000. He's like, 120 is 30 grand a year. That's what I'm saying. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> he says, you know, I give you a call back, calls me back and say, hey, you know what? We'll do this. Uh, we'll give it to you 50% off. I'm like, wait, 15 grand? He's like, yeah, it's on sale, half off. So at that point, I knew for sure I was going to go to the school. So I came home to my family and I said, hey, it's on sale, 50% off. But he said, so 60,000. So it's 15. Like you have time to work to make up the other 15. So I said, we can't afford it. And really, that's when it hit me that in my lifetime, I no longer want money to hinder me from whatever it is that I wanted in life. Mm. So quickly, I wanted to start learning how to save, budget, investments, and insurance planning. Um, so then as a young adult, I think this is the point in our lives that we all make our big first financial decision. Where do I go to school? Yeah. And we look at school as an investment, ultimately. Like that's what it is, is whatever I'm gonna go study, sure I get this education, I get a degree, but what's my rate of return on earning said degree? Mm-hmm. So I knew business would have afforded me the opportunity to get a really good starting salary if that's the path that I went down. Um, so I wanted to go business, but I also knew early on that whatever you decide to major in, and I say this to really everyone, whether it's for undergrad, whether it's for your master's, whether you're going to law school or medical school, is whatever you graduate with from a student loan perspective, just make sure that your first year salary from your expected job equals or is greater than whatever you graduate with. Hmm. So majoring in finance, when I look at the opportunities I could have had, a finance degree when I graduated in 2015, on average was paying 60 to $70,000, depending on which field that I went into. So I knew, hey, if I go to college and I take out student loans, as long as I graduate with 60,000 or less, that was a good investment. Yeah. Now obviously the best investment is graduate zero loans, uh, but I knew if I took, spent 120 grand to then get a job and pay me 60, that was not a great investment for me. Um, so I decided to go to a state school because it's cheapest, an accredited business school, and got afforded the opportunity to play soccer when I was in college, Division One. So I went to Central Connecticut State University. And at first, I did not know that I wanted to go into finance. I thought I was going to become an accountant. And that's because in high school, my accounting teacher was just amazing, Miss Wellington. Um, she ended up teaching my younger brother as well in high school. And she just made it sound so fun. So mm-hmm. I thought I wanted to become an accountant. But then when I went to school, took a couple of classes, I realized that I love people. Yeah. I just sit behind a desk all day and just crunch numbers. So I cannot become an accountant. So I switched my major in college to finance. Let's face it. Starting a business is hard work. And building a website for a business, that's another story. Why not hire some help? 35th Street Builders are not just website builders, they're dreamers. With experience spanning in startups to enterprises, 35th Street Builders will provide you with the mobile app and web development skills to get your business up and running. At 35th Street Builders, they pride themselves on affordability, reliability, and compassion. Ready to take some work off your plate? You can schedule an intro call with 35th Street Builders by going to their website at 3sb.io. That's the number three, the letter S, the letter B, Io. What was your relationship and what was your family's relationship to money growing up? Yeah, it was this, I, I sometimes I think about it and I like to think about it from both perspectives in terms of what's going through their mind. Uh, in our culture, you just don't talk about money. Uh, if you have Nigerian friends or just anyone from Africa, like, your parents don't talk about money. Your parents are very s- secretive with just everything. It's I'm the parent, you're the child, that's the relationship. 
somehow there's a disconnect of let me actually educate you on money. And that's something that I'd, I'd love to change. And I had these conversations with my younger siblings when they were growing up too. It's like, hey, this is how money works. And just trying to educate them on this mm. stuff. But money wasn't taught, uh, spoken about in my family. It was always, we don't have money. But you start thinking to yourself, well, we just moved from a two bedroom apartment to a nicer house. Wait, you just got a nicer car. So I'm sure money is playing a role. You just went from six employees to 12 employees. So clearly there's money, but it just wasn't taught to us. What was taught to us was hard work. It was hard work. You got to get really good grades and you got to work really hard. Mm -hmm. As long as you're able to do those things, then you should be okay in life. And that was the message that was taught to us. Mm -hmm. I, and just being an entrepreneur, I remember I had my, when I was in the sixth grade, I was 10 years, 10, 11, I was selling candy in school and outside of school. Um, to the point where I hired people to start selling candy for me in school. And I'd be the kid that show up with bags for everyone to go sell. And I count like $30 and make sure they have singles and fives and tens to give change to other people. And I'd do an entire accounting and it's like cafeteria time, lunch time, and everyone's in line for lunch, but I got the table and I have my employees showing up and I'm doing all of my accounting there and just collecting <laughs> money. Uh, I got to the point that the uh, principal tried to suspend me for it. So I had to stop. <laughs> but then I go around the neighborhood and knock on doors and sell candy. And then it was, well, let's mow lawns. So I created a flyer for myself, passing around every single mailbox and knocking on the door and saying, I'm going to mow your lawn. Then it became, hey, let me get my first job working at a tobacco farm. And it wasn't just me. Hey, let me bring three of my friends with me. So I'd wake up at 5, 6 a.m., pick them up and drive them to work with me. Mm. Um, being in high school, my father has a trucking company. I'd work Friday nights. I'd work in the morning, go to school, come back, play soccer. I was constantly just taught to work hard. Yeah. That's what was taught to me. It wasn't necessarily money in terms of, hey, this is how you invest your money. This is how much you should have in emergency savings. Here's mm -hmm. how you get, you build good credit. Those weren't the conversations you were having. It's funny because those weren't the conversations that you were having, yet you were doing all of those things and you didn't even know you were doing it. Like by selling candy and then hiring people to sell candy for you, you were making your money work for you. Whereas like now you're, uh, you work in finance and like you have like stocks and you have 401ks and you have all these other ways of investing to make your money work for you. So you're working smarter, not harder. And like, even though those conversations weren't ha happening growing up, I feel like you probably were able to see those things happening within your father's company. And you were like in it, like you talked about how you come from a lineage of people that family that uh, own businesses. So you like, were getting it. There just weren't, there weren't, wasn't language for that yet. It seemed. Yeah. yeah. Amber, I'm grateful for my family. They will teach you how to make money in my family. If yeah. you're born with an alpha lobby, you're going to learn how to make money. It's just, it's in your bloodline to yeah. learn how to make money. What to me, to get to the next evolution of our family is how to keep the money mm. and have to have the money work for you. I have uncles and aunts, like they work their butts off and save tons of money. But then it wasn't until I got into my career where they started learning, wait, I can have my money actually working for me and I just keep everything in cash. Yeah. That's a completely different conversation that needs to be had. It's like, hey, you learn how to make money. Now what? So I'm very appreciative of my upbringing and what they taught me because that can be taken away from me. Mm. I'm always going to aspire to be the hardest worker in every single room that I'm in. It's just who I am. And I know if I work really, really hard, that's going to get me in places. But if I could couple the hard work with work and smarts, when you put that together, you're going to be an unstoppable force. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I love that you touched on that because I want to jump into your wealth management journey at the age of 19, because I remember what I was doing at 19 and it wasn't wealth management. Like, <laughs> it definitely wasn't that I should have been, but I just like, in reading more about you, you were at the age of 19, you went through a nationally ranked top 10 internship program with Northwestern Mutual. And for the listeners that are listening, Northwestern Mutual has been in business for over 160 years, making it one of the oldest and most established financial institutions in this country. So that is in, that's huge. You were also the number one intern in the East, ranked top 10 nationally out of 250 or 2,500 interns. Like, I know that you came from an upbringing of working hard, but like, <laughs> like this is a huge achievement. Like, what was your goal when you had um, started this internship? 
Yeah, um, I think I'll take a step back. My goal when I got to college as a freshman was to get an internship. Um, and the reason why I wanted an internship is I just want a head start on my career. Again, it's I just want my entire life, right? Just eight years old, you're uprooted from the country, the life that you knew to a different place. And then you're promised this thing where you're forced to do this one thing. So in your mind, the way I make my family proud is to go to college. Mm -hmm. And they work your butt off and you finally get that same opportunity and they say, hey, we can't afford it. Mm -hmm. So when that happened, it's like, I no longer want this. So my desire is how could I change the trajectory of my life? And I realized that the best way for me to get a jump start in my career is to get an internship. So as a freshman, I came in and playing soccer, doing all this fun stuff, got a 3-7 my first semester. And then I started applying to a bunch of internships and I applied to 20 different internships. And they all told me no. And I realized that the way I was doing it was wrong. I was doing it the same exact way. I was going online and submitting an application, going online and submitting an application. And then I realized that the people that are getting all the internships were the juniors and the seniors. So I had to pivot. And this is when I started networking. And I intentionally started hanging around with all the juniors and the seniors. The seniors. And a good friend of mine who was a 4.0 student, president of accounting club, was the one that was actually getting that internship opportunity at Northwestern. Excuse me. But the thing is, when you set a goal, make it public, make it big, make it bold and tell the world about it because you have no idea who could have a hand on your journey. And what he did was he pulled me to the side and said, hey, come with me um, and apply for this internship with me. And bro, I was so discouraged after 20 internships applied for and they all told me no. He says, what do you have to lose? You already got told 20 no's, just keep going. It's like, fine. So I remember showing up to this director's suite that they had for the UConn's Women's Final Four game. And I showed up in the suite and everyone ever had on custom suits and ties and looked sharp. <laughs> and I walked in with some corduroy pants, had on my father dress shirt. His was, he was bigger than me. And I had a tie on for free tie day. And somehow I just felt comfortable. And I just started speaking to all the right people. And I met the director of the internship program, started speaking with her. She says, hey, we'll interview you. And I remember my fifth interview being in my dorm room where she says, hey, Bilal, we'd love to have you uh, join our summer internship program. And I remember just asking me, like, Wait, say that one more time. She said, hey, Bilal, we'd love for you to join our summer internship program. Amber, true story. I got so excited, I hung up on this lady. <laughs> <laughs> and I ran out my dorm screaming, let's go, we did it. And my friends are out there room thinking, is he okay? I was like, you guys have no idea what just happened. And I called her back and I said, hey, Joey, I'm so sorry. I think we got disconnected. And that was the start of my internship program. So it took me 21 applications to get an internship because I'm a savage. Or like 21 savage, 21. No, I get it. No, I love no, it. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't know about my listeners, but I get it. So you're in this internship, like, yep. obviously you are like a hustler. You like 20, you went through 21, like application, 21 no's, got a yes. And yeah. then, so what were some of the, like, what were you learning in this internship? Yeah, literally everything. Like I, the first thing that I learned actually that surprised me the most is I showed up day one, sat front row, showed up early, notes ready. And this says, hey, your assignment today is create a vision board. I'm like, wait. You mean like you're going to talk about stocks and bonds and mutual funds and ETFs and like retirement planning and investments? Like, no, 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 you're going to create a vision board. And I was just so shocked that day one of a top 10 internship in financial services in corporate America at a Fortune 100 company was mm -hmm. to create a vision board. And I remember going through that exercise, completing it, and you had this binder, we had to print out pictures, and we did it for zero to three years, four to seven years, and seven years and beyond. And I thought it was a complete waste of time, but we had to put that front and center of our binder that we carried with us all the time. And every time we did something it was right there. So I carried this binder with me the entire time. And I remember being 24 years old, haven't seen this binder in five years. And I was cleaning out my room at my parents' house because I bought a house. And I remember going under the bed, pulling out this binder and in front of the binder was in five years, buy a house. And I had the rest of my goals listed on it. And I had every single thing that I had written down except for one. What were some of the things on your vision board? Uh, it was to make sure that I graduated college. I was saving X amount of dollars. I was driving a BMW, which I was. Um, 
literally everything. And the thing that I did not do was to go to a Celtics game. So <laughs> <laughs> I later went to a Celtics game. But what I learned from that is that your words are so powerful and your vision is so powerful. It so is. always have your vision, make it bold. But what could have made that even better is if I actually took a look at it more consistently. Yeah. I could have crossed the Celtics game off. So now everything that I do in my life, I do with a big vision. Hmm. And I make it bold and I start to share that with everyone else so they know where I'm headed and you have no idea, again, who can help you on your journey. No, absolutely. And I love that you touched on when you have a goal to like shout it. It's funny because a lot of people say to do the opposite, like, and you have a goal, keep it to yourself. You know, you don't want anyone to like cloud your judgment. You don't want, yeah, all the things. But I often, I, like, I, I think I have the same thoughts as you in this is like when I have something that I'm so passionate about, I talk about it until I'm blue in the face because you never know who is going to be out there who can help you. Um, so I, I love that. I wanted to talk about, so the fact that you were an intern with North Northwestern Mutual and you've, you still work for Northwestern Mutual, right? Yeah. So the first almost nine years of my life, it was just Bilal, Northwest Mutual, Bilal, Northwestern Mutual. And I realized that what I was big in, building was so much bigger than me. Yeah. So instead of just keeping everything Bilal, we decided to, to change it up and say, hey, let's actually build a firm, mm -hmm. an enduring firm. And to do that, we needed a name. So I started to think through, well, who are the clients that we serve the most? And most of our clients, Amber, they're first generation, second generation. There's a sprinkle of third generation there. And these folks are either first or second to inherit wealth or build wealth or first positions, executives, business owners, retire in their family, put their kids through private school, establish trust, um, live in certain neighborhoods, make half a million, a million, 10 million plus. And these folks tend to be the most successful, if not one of the most successful people in their families. And their families tend to look at these individuals as a definition of happiness and success. So we call these folks the chosen ones. Hmm. And what we want to build is a group that advises them. So the name of our firm is Chosen Advisory Group. And those are the clients that we serve today. So, so over the last few years, that's what we've been building. Yeah, I I love that. I want to I want to take a step back though, because you're touching on a really important part here. But so you worked for Northwestern Mutual for nine years mm -hmm. and decided that what you what your goals were were bigger than what you were currently doing mm -hmm. um can you tell me first what you were doing before you decided to create your own firm uh honestly it was, it was similar I, I think the difference was i put all the focus on Bilal. okay and what, what i realized is that what we're building now is going to serve hundreds and hundreds of thousands of families and it's hard to have a close relationship with thousands of people mm -hmm. So if you have a big enough lever, you can change the world. So I had to create that lever. And that's what really led to this firm that we created, Chosen Advisory Group, where now it's not just me. And also funny, some of the questions that I was getting from clients is like, hey, so if you're on vacation, like, who do we call? And I was yeah. like, well, right, you had to build a firm to say, hey, Bilal's not here. Well, you can reach out to Andrew, Brianna, and so, so, so far, so yeah. forth, so forth. So now there's a firm that's there. So now the thing that my clients will say is like, hey, you just all can't fly at the same time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we, let them know that we can, and we still have a back office. So although we have chosen advisory group, strategically, we had to align ourselves with another firm anyway. So mm -hmm. what we decided to do for like our back office, our compliance, our, our clearing is keep a relationship with Northwestern Mutual for all the same reasons you said at the beginning of this conversation. So chosen advisory group is a firm that provides the client experience. But you get the backing of a Fortune 100 company, AAA rated, that still give us proprietary access to some of their products and offerings as well. So what's really interesting, and the reason I had you backtrack a little bit, is because you have your own firm, but you're still it in a relationship, like you have relations with Northwestern Mutual. And one thing that I want to touch on, I know that this is a an on, this is an entrepreneurial podcast. We talk about people who are entrepreneurs, that I want to really hone in on the fact that um, 
you don't have to be a solo entrepreneur. You can be an entrepreneurial within a company and they call that entrepreneurial. And that's what you're doing with um, Chosen fi- Advisory Group. Am I right? Absolutely. It's okay. your business for yourself, uh, just not by yourself. A lot of benefits to that, uh, making sure that not everything is on you, right? So I have access to a back office of 30 plus attorneys that I could tap into if I ever need help with anything. Uh, we just have such a huge intellectual property that I have resources to mm-hmm. that will be beneficial. And also, I realize our clients also appreciate that, uh, having that relationship as well, because they know that, hey, if Bilal is in here or got free chosen advisor group in here, which we don't ever see happening, yeah. there's companies that they can really tap into. Um, Tell me, like, walk me through the steps and how you, the steps that you took to branch off and create your own firm. Yeah. Uh, the first thing is you have to think, do you really want to do this? Because it takes a lot to really build a business, especially a wealth management business. You're going to be in the space where the average age of an advisor is 57 years old, where you're going to be an infant, essentially, when you start this thing. Uh, I could have been okay and just cruise with just Bilal the entire time throughout my career, retire, have a pretty good life. But that just felt like such a small life for me. If you have the opportunity to help the world and you choose not to, to me, that's a small living and I was not meant for that. Mm. So you have to have the faith and the confidence that, hey, I'm going to build something that's much bigger than me, that's going to last long after I'm gone and impact many, many lives. So first, that was the decision. The second thing is who's coming on this journey with me? Because I think one of the big mistakes that a lot of entrepreneurs make is that they think they're going to be the person to do everything. Yeah. You're not. You're not. So, I mean, big shout out to my team right now. They are so much smarter than me in so many spots. And your clients that you work with, they appreciate seeing that. They don't want to call the lot for every single thing. It's at the point where I have some clients where they said, hey, you know what, Bilal, if I need to get something done, I don't even call you. I'll call your team. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if I want to feel good about something, then I'll call you. So we could create the plan, but they're really good at executing and making sure things happen. Um, and then starting to hire people that are much smarter than you. And that's that's also very interesting yeah. because you have people that are working on, in, in your firm that are smarter than you in spots. And being able to acknowledge that and ha- being able to still coach and educate said individual so they can continue growing um, is also really good. So I'm starting to think through those steps is create a vision. Who's going to go on this vision with you? Uh, and then you work really, really, really hard. Really, really hard, especially in the, in the beginning, because you're trying to get this thing off the ground. You're trying to get people to recognize that, hey, it's no longer allowed, it's chosen. So now you're rebranding yourself. And mm. I hired a brand strategist, uh, Emily Allen. Uh, Amavi Studios, she was absolutely amazing. And she helped create the logo, the color scheme, everything that we needed. She was really, really instrumental in that. Having Canva, I knew nothing about Canva. Uh, I think it's a saving grace, me. yes. Oh my God. I, I just, I pay for the thing, Amber, but I know nothing about Canva. But she does that, right? And this yeah. com- it just comes back to having a team. Yeah. And creating all these documents and in my industry were highly regulated. So getting everything compliance approved, um and just having a team to push all that stuff through so you're balancing that with existing clients you're looking to get new clients as well while you're building this business it definitely becomes very time consuming uh but later you're going to be able to look back i think the question you asked me earlier is imagine eight-year-old you how would they feel about where you are today i just imagine 60 year old me looking back on me now and this journey that i'm on and hopefully uh the 30 year old me could say to the six year old, I'm proud of you. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, it's it's so important that you're mentioning building out a team and building out a team means build or hiring people that are smarter than you, because I think that's where a lot of businesses fail and like hiring your friends and also having the humility or like the, just knowing that like you can't do everything and that you aren't skilled in everything. What kind of leader would you say that you are on your team? Uh, I think I constantly, I'm the visionary. I'm constantly coming up with the vision for us. And I set the tone as a leader. And I think those are your job. That's your job as a leader is your team needs a sense of direction in terms of where they're going. And 
And I share my vision with my team so they know where the firm is headed. And also I'm able to create a vision for them and their role as part of this team. Mm -hmm. And constantly I'm asking for their feedback. Hey, like this is where the firm is headed. Where do you see yourself? Like, hey, we're going to go hire six more people in the next three years. What role do you want to play? Because you're here now, so you have the freedom to pick and choose the role that you want to play. Mm. So one of my employees, he's becoming a certified financial planner as well in his 20s, which the stat on that, to be a certified financial planner, there are more certified financial planners over the age of 70 than there are under the age of 30. Why is that? It's just an old industry. It's just a very, very old industry. So someone that's 70, chances are they're going to retire soon. So what happens to all their clients? And you have 10,000 baby boomers retiring every single day. They need a firm to tap into. Mm -hmm. uh, Brianna on my team, she's 20, she's 20 years old with an MBA. She's extremely brilliant. And then we're looking to continue hiring more people. It's like, hey, this is our vision. Where do you want to go? And then when you set the tone as the leader is you're the one that's constantly out there doing most of the work. Uh, they'll get, I, I, I got better at this in terms of delayed delivery, but they'll show up the next day and say, I saw you sending out emails at 9, 10 PM at night, relax. And then you're the first person in the office and you're the last <laughs> person to leave. So you set the tone. So when you ask them to do something, yeah, there's never, no, I don't want to do this. And then also, I think I am so laid back as a leader and allow your team to make mistakes. It is so hard. It is so much easier to hold other people accountable than it is to hold yourself accountable. Mm -hmm. And I think so many people get that messed up. Where yeah. I've seen leaders like, well, they work for me, so therefore they, no. I don't call them employees. It's my team. We're part of a team. Yeah. So no one of my team, my team, I just said again, no one of my team is considered an employee. We're all part of a team where we get this vision together. Um, and we're looking to hire someone else. And that person has to interview with everyone on our team. So I feel sorry for employee number 21 because you're going to talk to 20 different people before you get to mm. 21. Uh, maybe you'll stop it because that's highly inefficient. Um, I was going to say, how many rounds of interviews do you make your uh, your people go through? Uh, the next, the person that's in the interview process right now, it's four interviews in an assignment that they have to complete for us. <gasps> you're one of those? Yeah, Absolutely. The, the, pro, the goal of that is we don't expect these in, this individuals to know every single thing and think like us, but we want to get their creative juices flowing. And we also want to know that like they know their stuff mm -hmm. because what we're dealing with is people's life savings. People come to us and they share things with us that they don't share with anyone else in the world. Mm. When people, so many clients, when they're pregnant, we're the first to know they're pregnant. So many clients, they have conversations with us about money that they've never told anyone before. Mm -hmm. And it's a very safe, vulnerable space for them. So we take this very, very seriously. We don't take ourselves too seriously, but we take the job very seriously. Yeah. Because if someone's coming to us and say, hey, I want to make sure that I could buy a home in the next couple of years. Oh, we got to make sure that we're going to be here to deliver, make sure they could buy their home. And it's a very easy process for them. Or yeah. well, they're retired and they spend 30 plus years working, saving all their life savings. And they say, hey, Bilal, we're going to trust you and your firm to manage our retirement assets and send us a check every single month until we die. Oh, yeah. we don't take that lightly at all. So you have to hire the right people in order Absolutely. to achieve that. I want to talk a little bit about your target audience like who are your clients and you touched on it a bit but I want to know when you were starting your firm why retirees and why were boomers your primary demographic yeah it wasn't when I started um when I first started it was literally just anyone that had a heartbeat <laughs> like hey you want to talk money I help um, when you was, started at North at Northwestern Mutual, or when you started the Chosen Advisory Group at nineteen at Northwestern Mutual. Okay, that, that was the start. Okay, uh, it was any and everybody. Then it went to young engineers, and that's because my best friend is an engineer. Uh, and then over time, it continued to grow. It's like, hey, corporate folks, and we went through physicians, we went through the attorney space, and today most of our clients that we serve are, to your point, either retired or near retirement. Um, and then the other demographic is the emerging affluent. 
so the acronym for those folks are Henry's. Mm. High earners, not rich yet. And oftentimes they are physicians, they are executives, they are business owners, they are attorneys, they're corporate folks, um, and they just had a long career in corporate America. And that tends to be our space that we're spending a lot of time in. Uh, really what led us there is, I think in that space, there's a thought process again of our people we attract are just the most successful people in their families. Yeah. And we like to work in that space because our opinion is that those folks have such a voice and influence that when they speak to other people, other people will listen to them. Because unfortunately, we can't serve the entire world. There are people that would we'll never meet, and that's okay. But hopefully, through the people that we've been able to assist, they have the right information that they can share with other people. So mm -hmm. the reason why the pre-retiree space as well, to, to me, is just very complicated um, in terms of actually retiring and having all these options and decisions to make. And you don't have the time anymore to make a mistake. So we want to be in that space to take care of them. There's 10,000 of them retiring every single day, um, especially in the space where sometimes, especially when they look like us too, uh, shockingly, they don't get the same level of care that I've seen uh, in this industry, unfortunately. So that means a lot to me. And our firm is young. So they want to work with us. The yeah. last thing that that space wants to do is work with an advisor that's their age because they're going to retire at the same time. When they're 65, wow. they're at the same time looking at each other. It's like, no, I want you back working and looking at my investments for me. Well, guess what we're doing? We're the people that's working and making sure we take care of them. And then what happens naturally is that that demographic start introducing us to their kids. So then we start working with the next generation to make sure that they're much better off than their parents are and grandparents and so forth. Good point about your clients and that your clients who are um, looking to retire older, the baby boomers, if you will, um, that they are looking to you to advise them because the people who would usually advise, advise them are their age and are also going to be retiring. So I did not think about that. And that is so true. What do you think that you are providing these clients that they can't find anywhere else? I think it's a sense of just peace and care. I, I think our clients, they walk away just with a sigh of relief just know that things are taken care of. I think people hire us mainly because we get things done for them. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of times like, hey, we wanna do this, we wanna do this, but they never get to it. And the next thing they'll be chosen and it gets done. So I think that happens. We're really, really good at holding you accountable and we make it very easy to have a conversation with us. Mm -hmm. So I think what's different is the way we're able to deliver, uh, the way we're able to build relationships with people and also share our level of care for them. And when we meet with our clients, especially in that space, it's not just them, it's we wanna take care of their next generation. And I think that's just, it's just so missed in our industry today because in their mind, they're thinking, well, kids don't have all the money. Well, the kids are going to have all the money. And for us, we're still growing. So we just wanna work with all the generations that we possibly can. Or when you work with our emerging affluent folks, Sometimes they're just in the Sanders generation mm -hmm. where they are the most successful financially, or you take, I don't know, two physicians and they're married and they're in their thirties, they're high earners. They're not rich yet, but maybe they make more than their parents. Maybe they have young children and now they're taking care of their parents and the next generation. They want someone to care for them. Yeah. It's like, who's looking out for us in our, in our best interest. And that's really what we come in with. And I think that's why people constantly work with us is because of those reasons. How are you setting them up um, and their families up? How are you setting these families up for success for the next generation? Oh, that's a great point. That's a really, really good question. So the first thing is we make sure they're okay before we focus on the next generation. So that's always first and foremost is, I guess the old saying is, if the plane is going down, you put your mask on first. So we meet with our clients like, hey, are you okay? We take care of their plan. We understand their vision, their values. Once we know they're okay, they say, hey, this is what we have extra. So a lot of times we meet folks where they say, hey, I already have an advisor or, hey, I've been doing this stuff on my own. It's like, hey, that's fine, but we can still work with you on the consultative approach and just create the math to really bring to life what your vision is and put the numbers next to it. Mm -hmm. And what happens sometimes is some people, they just done a great job of saving money that they have excess capital, money that they would never spend. So what we start to think through is strategically, what's the best way to give to the next generation? 
And one of the things that we really harp on, and I think another reason why people like want to work with us, is other advisors that we've experienced, it's more about, hey, how do we save money? How do we save all the money? But us, it's like, how do we have fun? Like, I want my clients to go out and live their life. Mm-hmm. So we put a really, really robust spending, uh, spending plan. Say, hey, like, instead of waiting to take that trip in five years, let's take that trip today. Mm. Let's not wait. Let's do that now. You're going on that trip, upgrade the first class, upgrade the room. Like, have all these life experiences now because in retirement, there's two ways to fail. One is not having enough money. I think we all agree there. But chosen, we just view failure as well as being 85 years old and having way more money than experiences. So how can we make sure that you are having those experiences today in a very responsible way? So I, I love that. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, 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 no. So they're, they're very excited about that. Yeah. Um, and then the legacy play is obviously we'll, we'll do the math to figure out what's the best assets to leave the next generation. But at the same time, I think the next generation like us for this too. It's like we try to get the parents to pay for the weddings. We try to get the parents to give them money for deposits for the homes. It's like, yes, help wait. us out. <laughs> exactly. Like don't wait till you die to leave the legacy. Yeah. Like let's see some of that stuff that you want to do. Like pay for your kids. If they have student loans, pay it off if you can for them. Yeah. Uh, but the fear is they don't know if they have enough to do that. I love that you're saying that because I think that well, my dad is retired. My mom is on her way and they have several friends that are in that stage where they're trying to figure out what their next chapter is going to be. And I think that there's this great fear of how they're going to not outlive their money. And I like that you are coming at it from a perspective of like, yes, we have all this money, but you should also be able to, you work so hard, you should be able to have fun with the money. But oftentimes it's like, how am I going to do that without like losing control? But it sounds like you're coming up with a strategy so that that doesn't happen. And I I like, I like that that's uh, what you guys do. Absolutely. That's it. We want you to enjoy your money. Money is a tool. Enjoy it. Go on all the trips. We love that. We mm-hmm. have clients where they buy their dream home and they send us pictures of it. And you just see like the sunset and you see the water in the background. And we're like, that makes me so happy. Yeah. Because the traditional advisor that we've experienced is all about just save, 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 save. And yes, we are big advocates of that as a certified financial planner. We want you to save money, but we also want you to enjoy your life at yeah. the same time. This should be a fun experience. Experience. It shouldn't be stressful. Money totally. should not be stressful. And that's our tagline. Life is stressful. Money should not be. For the younger people that are listening to this episode, working with people of affluence, like what do you find are some of the behaviors of like these highly successful people or these high like value people um, that we can learn from in order to follow the same footsteps? Uh, The biggest one is paying themselves first. And I think a lot of us, we heard that before, but literally paying yourself first. That is the most important thing you could possibly do. Automation is your friend. I know sometimes it feels very fearful, but automation is your friend. Always take the free money they give you. So for the younger audience who... Perhaps you have a job in corporate America, they give you a retirement plan with free money, they call that a match. Please take it. Mm. Please take all of it. Uh, My rule of thumb, and we aspire for this, is we want that emerging affluent clientele to save 20 to 30% of their gross income. And gross just means if you make 100 grand, then that's 20 to 30,000. If you make 200, right, that's 40 to 60, and so forth. But the goal that we aspire for is that 20 to 30%. In my entire career, 11 plus years now, I have never met anyone. Like I can't name a single person unless they inherited wealth. That was saving 10% or less of their gross income that was ever on track for any of their financial goals. I just haven't met that person. So there's anything I could give you from a vice perspective is aspiring to save 20% your girls and if you can't start with one and then get to two and then get to three and these folks what happened with the automation and just keeping percentages is that when they get income increases they get raises bonuses etc because it's automated they don't feel it as much mm. it is so much harder to go from 
making $200,000 to spending money as if you're making 150 than it is being at 150, uh, thinking to yourself like, oh, I'll just wait till I get to 200 to start saving money. You just never do it. Mm -hmm. You never do it. So as early as you could possibly start, just create the habit of paying yourself first. In the first place, I think, is your retirement plan through your employer. And if you're self-employed, uh, make sure that you still are paying yourself too and just automating it. Mm -hmm. I get it. I get it. Reinvest back into your business. Do that. I'm a business owner. I understand that as well. But at the same time, just put something to the side for yourself. Some of the basic stuff that I, if you just walk away with this, even as a self-employed individual, get that Roth IRA. And if you make too much money, you can do a backdoor, look into this on your own, but at least put that money away. If you're under 50 this year, $7,000. If you're over 50, it's $8,000. At least do that. Uh, that's going to go a very long way for you. I was going to ask that question, actually, for the people who are solo entrepreneurs that don't have the benefits that you would get in a nine to five corporate job. Like, I guess, what what is some advice that you can give them in order to save? Yeah, absolutely. So if you are self-employed and let's say right now it's just you and you're starting out, you can do a few things. You don't need the formal 401k or simple IRA, SEP IRA stuff. You can literally just start with a Roth IRA, or traditional IRA for yourself. It's okay. Excuse me. As you continue to grow your business, if you want to attract some of the right employees to you, then you will have to start offering some of these benefits, um, whether that's a simple IRA uh, or 401k. I know right now there's a lot of great credits to set up a 401k for a lot of business owners mm -hmm. where it almost feels as if it's cost neutral. Um, so it's worthwhile to perhaps explore that with the right professional. We'll reach out to your advisor to see if they can help you with that. If not, they may be able to point you in the right direction to set that stuff up for you. Um, but those are some great things for you to have. Set up a retirement plan anyway. I know a lot of business owners, the big mistake is, well, my business is my retirement plan. My business is my retirement plan. And when I retire, just sell my business. Mm -hmm. There's too many variables in that to just bet on that one thing. Yeah. I think grandma always said, right? Don't pull up your eggs in one basket. Like, listen to grandma. Grandma knew what she was talking about. <laughs> uh, so even outside of your business, have some money to the side as well. And I think those formal retirement plans work. Simple IRA, 401k, SEP IRA, traditional IRA, Roth IRA. It just depends on your situation and speak with a professional that could really help you uh, make that decision. I started this episode by asking you, or not started, but in this episode, I asked you what your relationship was to money back in the day. Like, what do you think your relationship is with money now? It's just a tool. That's all that it is. Money is a tool that's going to determine the neighborhood that you live in, the schools your kids go to, your access to health care, the type of foods that you consume. That's all that it is. Money is simply a tool. You can use it to have great experiences, great memories. And the way I look at money now is how can I use it for the best way possible to enjoy my life? Mm -hmm. And whether that's giving to things that really matter to me, um, for me right now, my big things that I care about is I care about education. I care about hunger. So naturally I give a lot to those causes because it means a lot to me. Um, I care about giving back last year. Uh, I was able to take my mom back home to Togo Africa for the first time in 20 years with my younger sister. Like that's all money is just a simple tool to allow you to do that. Um, money is allowing us to hire more people to build our businesses. Uh, money makes life so much easier in different parts of our lives. Um, money is going to determine the car that you drive. Like all that stuff plays into it. And I have a very, very healthy relationship with money. Money does not stress me out. Once upon a time it did because I did not know money. Hmm. But now that I know money, it's not fearful. It's like anything in life. It's like, oh my God, I'm such a, I'm a young kid. I'm afraid to go to high school. Well, you've never been to high school. So it's hard for you to experience it. But you go to high school, you realize, oh, this isn't that bad. I'm afraid to go to college. Well, you've never been to college. So it makes sense we have those fears and you're there. You're like, okay, this isn't that bad. I'm afraid of this or that. But the more you start to learn about money, the more you realize it's simply a tool. And what also happens is when you have your long-term vision of where you want to go in life and you save the right amount of money, you get to spend everything else guilt-free. Yeah. Everything else guilt-free. So I look at money as this is, this is fun. It's like, where could I spend the money to maximize my happiness? 
because I already saved the right amount of money. So now the rest of it just comes down to what do I actually want to do? Yeah. I love that. That's such an important lesson. A few weeks ago, when you and I were talking, you had mentioned that you are now teaching your niece about money and she's really excited about investing. And I loved that because one thing that you and I have in common is how much family means to us. So how do you think that you, you talked a little bit about giving back is so important to you, but how are you um, helping your family to talk more openly about money and also setting them themselves up for a better future financially and also for the next generation? Yeah. Uh, so all the, it's so fun. So this first started when I was 19, but all the kids in my family have life insurance. Like every single kid, like from younger siblings, to nieces and nephew, uh, nephews, and even a few cousins now, as soon as someone is born, we're getting life insurance. Mm-hmm. On them. So now it's clockwork. So the education is there uh, for that. And now the evolution now is they're opening up their own investment accounts. So my niece opened up her investment account a couple of weeks ago. And the best part about it, she reached out to me for it. No. So what I try to get sensitive with is I just don't want to become the person that's constantly talking about it. Yeah. It's at the point where they all know what I do. So I'm trying to just tiptoe my way into just having them ask and have these conversations. So she just went out her way and said, hey, uh, I think I want to start investing now. How did I do this? And then she opened up her first account. Uh, she got $50 for opening it. And then we're on the phone. I said, 100 bucks. I was like, let's go. Let's do this. That's awesome. Um, and then she said, what's the first thing I should buy? And that was a really fun conversation for us. She goes, I think. So I asked her, like, what do you want to buy? She's like, ah, maybe Starbucks. <laughs> Starbucks. Um, <laughs> like, what about Sephora? Should I buy Nike? So she started listing all this stuff. And I said, hey, what if there's a way for you to just buy 500 of the largest companies in America all at once? Mm-hmm. what I was like yeah you could buy all 500 at the same time I think we want to do that she's like I agree let's do that so she bought the S&P 500 and that was her first ever stock that she bought uh ETF that she bought and then later that week she sent me a screenshot she ended up buying Starbucks so she loves Starbucks um so it's just so fun because now she has the bug and now she's like oh, yeah how know? old is she uh gabby is 16 oh my god yeah by the time she's like our age she's gonna be well on her way she's gonna be doing just fine oh gabby's out of this world when she was 13 or 12 12 she started her own makeup line uh no lip gloss line and she started making everything at home uh she started selling it got an etsy account uh she was considering etsy alibaba amazon she's like yeah analyze all of them and Etsy was the cheapest place for me to market my products. Uh, and she was selling to the point she was selling out as soon as things happened. Oh my and God. she just stopped. I was like, why'd you stop? She's like, yeah, it's too stressful. <laughs> but she just learned how to build a business, had a business account and set all this stuff up. So it's, she's amazing. You now, tell Gabby to hit me I, up so she can be on a bright idea. I should. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to have a young person on the show to teach us all a lesson. <laughs> Where can people find you or how can people work with you? Absolutely. Um, so because my name is Bilal Afalabi, there's not many of us on planet Earth. So if you go on Google and you literally Google Bilal Afalabi, I promise <laughs> I'll be the first one to pop up. Uh, you can also look up Chosen Advisory Group um, after you type in my name. But it's Bilal Afalabi on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, uh, www.chosenadvisorygroup.com. Uh, that's our website. Uh, you can email chosen advisory group at nm.com. Uh, you can get a hold of me that way. Um, what else? That's pretty much it. You can find me pretty easy to get a hold of. <laughs> that's awesome. Before I let you go, I want to play a rapid fire game with you. So you have to answer quickly. Sure. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you could give one piece of financial advice to your younger self, what would it be? Pay yourself first what's the most unusual financial goal a client has ever had huh. unusual I, mm. I don't i don't ah are you I trying think, to be pc here no i'm really thinking of 
Also, people are pretty, people feel like they're different with like their goals and they're the only people in the world with this goal that they have. And then they share with you like, oh no, like other people have this too. Oh, I've heard of it before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, it's okay. Uh, but nothing out of the ordinary. I see like, no, I, I don't think I have anything that just so outlandish. I Not yet, that, at least. Yeah. <laughs> the company's still years. young. Yeah. He's like, 11 years. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. What's the craziest investment opportunity you've come across? Um, I had a person that when you get these crazy opportunities, because it's a dire situation for the person, uh, where they were getting like 50% interest to loan money for a month. And to me, that's extremely scary mm -hmm. uh, for someone to say they're going to pay you that much because why don't they just go to a bank and do it? Uh, clients spoke to me about it. Um, they had money. They didn't really need to do this, but they just wanted to. Like, that's what you want to do, do it. But I didn't really say, hey, go ahead and do it. But they chose to do it and they made 50% in a month. And that worked out for them. Interesting. But it's a one-off, right? Those opportunities yeah you know, exist. And typically if someone needs money, but in that situation it was a business, um, where I didn't tell them to end up doing it because the business, they were going to sell a product. They had the letter of intent already, and they just need the money to fulfill the order. And they were just want to pay that much interest for it. And it worked out for them. Hmm. Sounds risky, but risky. it worked out. It worked out. <laughs> yes. If, if you weren't in, uh, the career you have right now, what profession would you have? I'd probably become a soccer coach. Oh, you could be a soccer coach now. I don't have the time to <laughs> do that right now. Um, but yeah. I'd would be, you coach kids? I don't have the patience. Oh, okay. Children. Um, I don't have any children, but when I do, I'm going to not enjoy the whole kicking and screaming part of their lives. I want them to get old enough where they can strategize and actually know how to line up and pass the ball around. Mm. Uh, but I can't just jump there. So I don't think I'd coach that. I don't know. Probably like a high school team to start. I go college, maybe a professional team. I don't know. Maybe that might be like a good retirement goal to retire and see how far I could go in coaching a professional soccer team. Maybe I could go coach Chelsea in England one day. Like, I yeah. Know. You know, you were supposed to do that. Like I was supposed to play for them. 11 so years ago. <laughs> it didn't work out. <laughs> What's your favorite financial book? Uh, the Psychology of Money. By? Morgan Housel. Awesome. He is my favorite author. Uh, he's a distant mentor of mine. Um, and yeah, I love his book. It's right there on the bookshelf, The Psychology of Money. I am a fan. So I highly recommend that for everyone to read. Love that. My dad sends me like these scary financial books that's like, read me or stay poor. It's like, okay. Yeah, no, no. The psychology of money is a very light read. Uh, there is no fancy, crazy terminologies in there. There's no charts. Uh, it's pretty simple. And I, I love like that. It. So give it a shot. <laughs> okay. I'll for you. I'm going to send that to you. Oh, I would love that. Okay. What's your, okay. Hold on. I have one more. Yeah. When you're not being a financial advisor, what can we find you doing? Uh, I am probably on a date with my fiance. I Love am that. Traveling with my fiance. Uh, I am playing soccer. Um, I'm learning golf. So that's a new thing for me. Um, those are pretty much it. I am a homebody. Um, and if I'm not doing those things, I'm probably on the phone with my mother, my father, my niece, my little brothers. So typically family, uh, for the most part, my fiance, or I am on a date with her. Like, that's really it. It's pretty simple. I have a simple life. It's not. I like love a that. I love yeah. that. Well, yeah. thank you so much for being on the show today. I loved our conversation and I feel like you gave so much, so many gems to our audience. So thank you. Amber, thank you so much for having me. This was amazing. Uh, I am a listener of your podcast. So to get on your podcast was really, really amazing. 
I certainly appreciate it. I will give the psychology of money over to you. Uh, and I can't wait for future amazing guests that you have on this podcast. Thank you, Bilal. That's it for this week's episode of A Bright Idea Podcast. Today's guest was Bilal Afalabi, founder of Chosen Advisory Group. If you would like to work with Bilal and his team to help you get your money right, you can reach out to him via LinkedIn at Bilal Afalabi. If you loved today's episode, then don't forget to like and subscribe to my podcast and leave a review. Shout out to my producer, Chris, for all the edits each and every week. If you have a bright idea or a topic you think I should cover on the show, hit me up on social media or email me at jacksonstreetmediaco.com. Until next time, I'm Amber Key.